The Bible called them plagues. Today we call them natural disasters, but they're actually one and the same. And the biblical plagues are coming back. Sandstorms have ravaged the face of the earth for millions of years. They have transformed entire continents. Civilizations located on the edge of a desert have always suffered from sandstorms. Despite all our advances in science and technology, this plague still drives people to the limits of endurance in the 21st century. But there are people who recognize that we bear some of the blame for sandstorms. They have declared war on this all-powerful enemy. The Guanting Reservoir near Beijing. It used to provide the Chinese capital with drinking water but not anymore. Dr. Christoph Peisert is examining the water with a Chinese colleague. Is it smelly? Yeah. Well, it's completely undrinkable. Foul water. It's terrible. Foul water. Yeah. Mm. What do you think? Is it quality grade four? F four or five. Maybe even five. Five, the worst level of the, for drinking water. What is mm. it inside? What do you think? Oh, smells like uh, some chemicals. Yeah. Chemical elements. Yes, a lot of. Mm. I don't know. What you can see, of course, is basically from from uh, from the agriculture. Yeah. This this is chemical uh, fertilizer. This is a new problem, but it's an echo of a crisis first recorded thousands of kilometers away, thousands of years ago. Egypt, 1,500 BC. The pharaoh was building a new royal city. He needed workers and used the Israelites as his slaves. After generations of oppression, the people of Yahweh demanded their freedom. But pharaoh hardened his heart. He refused to let the Israelites go. Again and again, Moses went to Pharaoh and warned him of the plagues that the Lord would visit upon the land of Egypt. Then the waters of the Nile turned to blood. Poisonous algae killed the fish. Frogs bred uncontrollably and invaded people's homes. They were soon followed by mosquitoes and flies. Diseases killed cattle and other animals. Hailstorms destroyed the harvest, and locusts devoured anything that was left. But Pharaoh was unrelenting. God sent more plagues. Right. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky, so that darkness will spread over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or leave his place for three days. I think the Egyptian people and their economy would have been devastated, and now they had this particularly bad dust storm. And these dust storms occur today, they're called comes in dust storms, um, and they occur typically in March and April, so these people who hadn't very much food left at all. They had to stay indoors because they couldn't go out for three days. And personally, they would have been shattered. They would have been really depressed, I think. The whole Egyptian nation would have been in a terrible state. Three thousand five hundred years later, sandstorms still pose a threat to humanity. Wherever there are deserts, there are sandstorms and the deserts are growing rapidly. 20% of the Earth's land surface is already desert, a giant source of sandstorms. The world's largest deserts are in North Africa and in China. The Ningxia Autonomous Region, on the edge of the Tangur Desert in China. Wang Yodeh 
a specialist in fighting the desert sands, is on his way to visit his home village, or what's left of it. He's looking at a shallow dip in the sand. Just a few years ago, it was a river. As a small boy, he often played on its banks. His mother was a farmer. She tended land on the other side of the river. Its yield used to feed the family. Beijing, a city of 11 million people, and every day there are more. This modern metropolis is growing exponentially, and so are its problems. Its climate is changing. It has less and less rain. Drinking water is running short, and sandstorms attack the city more and more often. The Chinese call the sandstorms yellow dragons. They usually strike between January and April. The wind freshens, and within a few minutes, the temperature drops five to 10 degrees. The sky darkens. Visibility gets worse and worse. Beijing isn't far from the Gobi Desert. The Gobi Sands are constantly on the move. A few kilometers from Beijing, the sandstorms have piled up this enormous dune, the Long Ba Chan. Different winds converge here, dumping huge quantities of sand. It covers everything and destroys all vegetation. A group of international experts is examining this phenomenon. They're trying to understand the connections between human activity and environmental changes. I think this, here's a lot of pollution coming out from the industry. All over the world, similar changes are taking place. Fertile land is becoming desolate. Rain isn't falling. With overgrazing, drought, and depletion of natural resources, the advance of desert is relentless. Kilometer by kilometer, the sand is swallowing up fertile land. China loses 3,500 square kilometers to the sandstorms every year. That's more than a small country like Luxembourg. After years of inaction, when their government refused to acknowledge the urgency of the situation, Chinese scientists are now busy working on solutions. Researchers at the Beijing Forestry University are only too aware of the disaster that's taken place. Sandstorms and dunes are advancing across the country, burying homes and agricultural land alike. The sand is advancing in Ningxia and in Inner Mongolia, explains Professor Wang Lixian, a veteran of Chinese desert research. The government knows the sand is permanently destroying fertile land, land that's urgently needed to feed China's 1.3 billion population. The government started out with many ambitious plans. They even sprayed seeds from aircraft, 
in the hope that at least some would sprout and prevent the worst of the sandstorms. But the results have been discouraging. Christoph Peisert is one of the experts advising the Chinese government. The German Society for Technical Cooperation, GTZ, is financing the international support group. Peisert has lived in China for nearly 20 years. He gives expert advice on how to grow trees in dry, impoverished soil. He specializes in forestry development. In the past few years, thousands of workers have laid down squares of straw in the desert sand across several hundred square kilometers. Dry straw like this cannot grow, but it can protect small plants from the wind. The idea is for it to act as a break on the storm winds to give young plants a chance. But all too often, the wind destroys the straw barriers and the desert warriors have to start all over again. Wang Yoda is the leader of a work group. Now close to retirement, he's been decorated for his tireless work. But Wang isn't ready to stop. He's been fighting sandstorms and the encroaching desert all his life. He doesn't want to give up until he has won at least in his own backyard. He's glad to have the help of the European experts. One of the scientists from GTZ is visiting to check on their progress. Wang tells her how his team protect themselves when a sandstorm takes them by surprise. Shama 才能为自孙后代造福, China's deserts cover an area larger than France, Germany, Austria and Switzerland combined. To plant them with vegetation is a colossal task. But the outcome isn't crucial to China alone. As storms increase in size and frequency, sand from all the deserts of the world is constantly moving. Climate scientists estimate that five billion tons of tiny particles enter the atmosphere every year. Some of them travel up to 10,000 kilometers. Where do they all go? That's a question for Professor Matthias Schott, of the Joanneum Research Center in Graz, Austria. Using satellite imagery, he can follow the sandstorm's journeys. In this Fall werden große erhebliche Sand- und Staubmassen äh, von den Wüsten nordöstlich äh, Pekins äh, verfrachtet in Richtung Osten und hier in diesem Fall über Peking und bewegen sich hier Richtung Meer. Und das hat natürlich sehr starke Auswirkungen auf äh, ja, die Luftgüter, äh, für die Bevölkerung leidet sehr unter solchen Sandstürmen. Und diese Sandstürme gehen auch äh, über Kontinente hinweg. Die machen eben nicht Halt hier an Landesgrenzen, sondern das sind eben äh, Phänomene, die äh, global zu beobachten sind. The pictures show that China is not the only country to supply the raw materials for sandstorms. They come from Africa too. Red dust from the Sahara is carried all the way to Europe. Jeder kennt diesen feinen äh, rötlichen Staub, der manchmal auf den Autos liegt oder auf den Blättern liegt. Das ist alles äh, Staub, der von der Sahara Richtung Norden nach Europa verfrachtet wurde. Musik 
Saharan sandstorms even carry dust particles across the Atlantic to America. What do they contain? Scientists from different disciplines have joined forces in search of an answer. At the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany, climate specialists can analyze the exact components of the dust in a sandstorm. Some members of the climate research group have just returned from an expedition. The case contains valuable dust samples, some of them collected during a flight through a high altitude sandstorm. The dust is examined under an electron microscope. The shocking truth is that the dust contains fungi and viruses that can cause epidemics in plants and animals thousands of kilometers from their original source. Pollutants and environmental toxins also hitched a ride. They were picked up as the wind bearing the sand grains passed through industrial areas. Neben dem Mineralstaub, der aus der Taklamakan und der Gobi in Richtung nach Osten transportiert wird, der geht über die großen Industriezentren von China hinweg. Da ist natürlich der Mineralstaub eine willkommene Oberfläche, auf die dann Sulfate und alle möglichen anderen Umweltverschmutzungen über Tausende von Kilometern herausgetragen wird in Richtung japanische See. Is that the spectrum was that too good? Modern technology not only allows the scientists to examine individual samples, it also enables them to analyze many thousands of dust particles from a single sandstorm. The experts can trace many of the particles back to their geographical origins. They can distinguish between the sand itself, made of quartz and minerals, and the fine organic material produced by living organisms and by industry. The sandstorm on the ground delivers the necessary energy so that the fine material, which is much smaller than the sand, can be high enough emitted so that it can be sold worldwide. Nothing escapes this forensic examination. The substances that are carried far beyond China's borders are sometimes entirely natural, but often they're man-made. Industrial and domestic waste, exhaust gases, and byproducts of biological processes. Environmental problems are a global issue. In biblical times, cross-border issues barely existed. The Egyptians of the Bible were concerned with their own immediate survival. They'd lived in the desert for generations and were accustomed to sparing use of their supplies of food and water. And yet the great sandstorm of the Book of Exodus took them by surprise. So I have personally experienced a dust storm like the Ninth Plague in Egypt. And I was in Kuwait, and it was a brilliantly sunny day, and I was outside in the street, and I looked up, and I suddenly saw this wall approaching me in the sky, and it stretched, it was a wall of brown, it approached me, and it was stretching from the sky right down to the street. And uh, I went back into my hotel, and I said, what's happening? And they said, dust storm, go to your room. And so I went to my room, and I got to my room, and the bright sunlight was still coming in through the window, but about five seconds later, it was pitch black, and I had to switch the light on in my room to see everything, because totally outside was covered, the whole atmosphere was full of dust, and you couldn't see anything. And I tried going out of my room onto the balcony, and I quickly came inside because your whole mouth filled with dust. You got dust in your hair, dust in your eyes. If you tried to breathe, it went up your nose. You just had to stay indoors. And so I think this is what happened to the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians. They just couldn't go out. They were confined, you know, to, to their houses and their tents. And it was it's a devastating effect.
The Chinese have ambitious plans to combat sandstorms. The most important is a belt of protective vegetation, 4,500 kilometers long, running beside the Great Wall. Once, the Mongols were China's greatest enemy. Now it's the sand, carried in by storms from the north. The government plans to repel this invader with a new wall of green. A belt of shrubs and trees is being planted to reduce wind speeds and prevent soil erosion. 350 million people are involved in what is officially called the Three North Protection Project. All the participants are active campaigners against desertification, according to the head of the project, Pan Ying Zhen. We have been working on this project, and we have been working on a big part of it. So, when we have been working on the environment, we have been working on the environment, and we have been working on the environment. Every year, public employees are given one or two weeks off to dig holes and plant trees. Vacant fields and empty plots are to be transformed into forests. According to an old proverb, every Chinese must plant one tree a year. The politically approved version today is every Chinese must plant at least five trees a year. If all of the 1.3 billion Chinese did their duty, that would mean 7 billion new trees. An amazing step forward. If only the earth weren't parched, the climate difficult and gales frequent. The trees are planted in a fanfare of publicity, but often they don't live long because no one looks after them. And there's another problem, parasites. They became a problem only after the project got underway. The green wall of poplar trees is growing, but the poplars are being attacked by insects. Hundreds of thousands of the trees have died. Carola Ver of the GTZ group is inspecting damage done by the poplar tree's arch enemy, the Asian long-horned beetle. So this is a typical sign for the coming. Uh, Abdul, the ticket and the expert oil. Resin leaks from the holes where the beetles bored into the tree. As only poplars were planted here, the beetles had a field day. Almost all the trees planted here died and had to be chopped down. It's normal that it is yeah, interrupted and that it has many of it. The cross section shows how the beetle bores into the wood, consuming the sap that nourishes the tree and making the timber worthless. On the ground, the scientists find fragments of bark, a sure sign that the beetles are active. This, this is a popular baliana. Mm -hmm. And this is a newer one, which has been planted after 94, after the last very serious damage of yeah, the plantation. Yeah, you're right. This we call that the second generation mm -hmm. species. The first generation we use a popular opera which have been totally destroyed by this beetle. Mm -hmm. After 94, we choose this uh, relatively resistant to, to LB species. 
this populous Polyana you, you see here, it looks good. To kill the beetles, sticks soaked in chemicals are inserted in the holes they have made. Even with low labour costs, it's a time-consuming and expensive procedure. Worse still, it's not especially effective. So, in the lab, they're looking for natural enemies of the beetle. Scientists have identified a predator that destroys the beetle's larvae. It's an insect by the name of Dastarchus. Now they're breeding them en masse in petri dishes. If they go on reproducing like this in nature, there may be a chance of defeating the long-horned beetle. The Dastarchus waits till the beetle has laid its eggs. Then it bores into the larva, nests within the pupa, and slowly consumes the pupa from the inside. But even if all these problems are solved, the greatest enemy is the lack of water. Sand is very bad at retaining moisture. The little rain that does fall seeps away at once. Whole areas of land have turned into desert and been abandoned, with no hope of their ever being reclaimed. Wang Yodeu planted trees on this spot 40 years ago, during the Cultural Revolution. Today, the whole region has dried up. There are no roots left to hold the last traces of moisture. When rain does come, it washes salt out of the stone, and that makes the little groundwater that remains almost unusable. In many parts of China, drought makes new planting almost impossible. And where there's no green, the rainfall declines even further. Entire rivers have dried up on their way to the sea. The water has been diverted to industry, agriculture or domestic use, and there's not enough new water to replenish the flow. Even these expensive irrigation canals have run dry. All of these problems are entirely man-made. China's booming industries are not only making the sandstorms more toxic, they are partly responsible for creating the deserts in the first place. They brought increased water consumption, a sinking water table, water pollution and dried up rivers. Here too, just a hundred kilometers from Beijing, there are dangerous water shortages. In this, the catchment area of China's capital, rainfall has declined over the last few years. Sometimes many months go by without a single drop of rain. These measurements are being taken at Miyuin Reservoir, the largest supply of fresh water for Beijing's 11 million people. The shortage of water is becoming acute.
Miyuin Reservoir was built by damming a river in 1960. Today, the reservoir is almost empty. These islands used to be well below the surface. This is the Shapato Desert Research Center. It studies what kinds of plant cope best with drought and wind. Not all plants are equally good at helping soil conserve moisture. Scientists are testing the ability of various plants to help store the rainfall in the earth. The conductivity of the earth and the density of the soil both play a part. This cellar was built directly beneath the test area. Sensors measure the tiniest changes in the weight of the different samples. They're literally weighing the ground and they take the measurements daily. The results will help the scientists make sure that the remaining water is used in the best possible way. Next door, their colleagues are analyzing different specimens of desert sand. Not all deserts are the same, and neither is the sand. They want to find out which soils and minerals suit which plants, and which plants need least water. The aim is to irrigate desert plantations more effectively. In the meantime, the precious groundwater is allocated according to a complex set of rules. The plants in these greenhouses are specially adapted to the tough conditions of the desert. They can withstand the wind, they resist parasites, and above all, they need very little water or nutrition from the soil. This center provides millions of saplings for the Green Wall and for Beijing. By the time the Olympic Games open, Beijing is hoping to have solved its sandstorm problem. It plans to be safe and clean. Yet the spread of the desert has caused average annual temperatures to rise in Beijing by several degrees. There are said to be plans to move this mega city and build a new capital in a more shielded location. Recently, Beijing experienced its worst sandstorm for 50 years. In the past, wind speeds greater than 130 kilometers an hour were recorded in Beijing once every five years. Now, sandstorms reach these speeds two or three times every year. So the government has taken further steps to get the sandstorms under control. Agricultural land surrounding the city is to be transformed into forests, in part forests of fruit trees. This is Christoph Peisert's area of expertise. He's on his way to a village called Mao Shergo, where he will explain to the farmers that planting fruit trees can pay. He's well aware that another aim of this policy is to protect Beijing's remaining drinking water. The farmers here receive a bonus if they transform their fields into orchards of fruit trees. Government subsidies, plus the prospect of income from the fruit, should guarantee that the farmers will look after the trees they plant. 
，嗯，都花了。Christophe and his colleagues are visiting farmers they have persuaded to stop using artificial fertilizers. These families no longer cultivate their fields, and they have sold all their goats. The head of the household now earns his living as an itinerant worker. But to make ends meet, the family relies on the extra money they make from their pear harvest. Es geht eigentlich darum, den Obstbau auch als Hebel zu benutzen, damit die, die, die sehr, der sehr große Anteil, den die haben an, an Forstflächen, damit, damit diese Forstflächen auch, auch gestaltet werden und, und geschützt werden und, und vor allen Dingen auch vernünftig bewirtschaftet werden. Das heißt, wir müssten mal fragen, also es heißt äh, richtig offiziell äh, äh, Wasserschutzwald. Die Forstflächen heißen Shuyuanlin. Das heißt äh, Wasserschutzwald. Just two kilometers below the village is the source for Beijing's drinking water. It's vital that the farmers here do not use artificial fertilizers to increase their yields. Nitrates and phosphates would certainly leach into the water with terrible consequences. Runoff from the drains is gathered in this channel so that scientists can check when rain comes what the rain is washing out of the earth. Und Phosphor. Also das ist ein ganz klarer Hinweis, dass äh, zu viel gedüngt wird, dass zunehmend mehr Residuen von, vom Dünger mit in das Wasser und damit in den Stausee gespült werden. One result of overfertilization can be algae and bacterial toxins in the drinking water. Some experts claim that the rate of liver cancer has risen sharply in Beijing because of these toxins. Problems with drinking water, drought, overgrazing and food shortages have a long history in China. As recently as the late 1960s, famine killed 30 million people in China. Wang Yodu was then a young man. He knows that in spite of China's rapid growth, or perhaps because of it, the threat of famine still exists. His life goal to defeat the desert is a strategy for survival. There are constant reminders. Close to Ling Wu, he finds the house he was born in. It's covered in sand a meter deep. Wang knows that his struggle will influence future generations, for the sandstorms may have serious consequences for the climate of the future. The Technical University in Darmstadt. Research here is revealing a completely new dimension to the biblical plague of the sandstorm. The storms aren't just the result of climate change. They themselves change the climate too. 
The sandstorms influence the overall temperature of the planet. They can even affect where it rains and where it doesn't. The scientists are about to examine some dust particles under an electron microscope. The particles have been cooled. They are at the temperature you would find in the upper atmosphere during a sandstorm. With high humidity and low temperatures, ice crystals grow on the dust particles in seconds. This is the stage immediately before the creation of raindrops. Sand in the atmosphere therefore affects the creation of rain, a finding confirmed by observations from space. Es gab durchaus schon äh, statistische Untersuchungen von Satellitenbildern, die äh, Sahara-Staubausbrüche über den Atlantik raus beobachtet haben und auch die äh, anschließend folgende Wolkenbildung. Und die haben halt Vergleiche äh, gemacht zwischen Situationen mit äh, Sahara-Staub und ohne Sahara-Staub und haben durchaus herausgefunden, dass auf dem Weg nach Südamerika, also aus der Sahara raus nach Westen, durch den Staub, der dort exportiert wird, die, Mol die Wolkenmuster und auch die Niederschlagsmuster verändert werden. Sand in the atmosphere can have the effect of causing rainfall exactly where it isn't needed, over the ocean, instead of over the steppes or the deserts. The ancient Egyptians can have known nothing of such connections. They experienced drought and storms, and they suffered the darkness of the Ninth Plague, defenseless before the forces of nature. The normal sandstorms just last normally a few hours. The three-day one, they would have seen it as something very severe. The consequences would have been that at the end of these three days, they would have been extremely hungry and extremely thirsty, I think because I think they would have exhausted the, uh, the supply of food and water they had in their houses. So they would have seen it either that their God was displeased with them, but, you know, Moses would have told Pharaoh, it's my God who's displeased with you. And that's how they would have seen it. The Egyptians found themselves confronted by a God who was inflicting a whole sequence of natural disasters upon them. The plagues came and went, their meaning lay in the sum of their consequences. The ten plagues of Egypt looked at through the eyes of science. We can see that one plague led to another. It was an ecological series of events. So for example, in the first plague, the river Nile turned to blood and the fish died because of the toxins emitted by the harmful algae. The toxic algae turned the Nile blood red and made the water undrinkable for man and beast. A disaster in a hot desert country like Egypt. The stench was terrible, but worse still, all the fish in the Nile died. The fishermen couldn't work and Egypt lost a major source of its food. The Egyptians may have sensed that the poisoning of the Nile would have other serious consequences. The fish had always lived off the smaller life forms in the river, especially frog spawn. As soon as the fish disappeared, the frogs and toads could breed unhindered. They emerged from the stinking waters and entered the Egyptians' houses in their tens of thousands. Now there were no frogs and toads left in the Nile and its tributaries to eat the larvae of the insects. And so the insects multiplied without limit. Stinging and blood-sucking insects tormented man and beast. The result was fever, malaria, boils and pox. Festering wounds tortured villagers and their animals. The cattle weakened and died a terrible death.
all those plagues were resulted from each other. And then that biological series stopped and we had a physical plague, which was the plague of hail. Hailstones fell and struck dead the animals, which, in spite of Moses' warnings, had not been brought under cover. The hail destroyed the corn days before the harvest. Thunder and lightning crisscrossed the country and the storms had a terrible impact. The strong winds brought the makings of a new plague. The saturated soil was the perfect breeding ground for locusts. They laid their eggs in the damp earth by the millions. They reproduced at astonishing speed. The swarms they formed descended on the corn that had grown again after the hailstorm. No stalk was left untouched. No green remained. The ninth plague was a plague of darkness, and the Bible describes it as darkness that can be felt. And, and this is a, a vivid description of a dust storm which blocks out the light from the sun. And this dust storm arises because of the first plague, when the Nile floods, a lot of mud is brought down and it's deposited on the banks of the Nile. The winds whip up this dust and cause huge dust storms, but it was a result of the first plague, so it, there was that connection even there. Red dust from the Nile's tributaries could have fed the toxic algae and could also have been the raw material for an especially thick sandstorm. Thus, the first plague was the cause of the last plague. The circle closed. Plagues cannot be seen as separate events. They have a meaning as a sequence of events from which a single message emerges. I think these are disasters which are happening in our natural world. And if you're a believer, you then say, God is working through nature to achieve these purposes, but there's something we can do to prevent them and to minimize them. And I think we have a responsibility to do that. And then, in the Bible, came the tenth plague. God let all the firstborn of the land of Egypt die in a single night. Only then did Pharaoh let the Israelites go. Exodus 